just like if you think you've written a really beautiful and stunning paragraph or sentence, you should probably get rid of it because it's probably bad. Um, but I do try to keep it in mind when I'm thinking about these things because I'm like, you know, I mean, I think getting so emotionally attached to a character that you can't stand to hurt them removes the conflict from the story. And when there's no conflict, there's nothing happening. It's just, you know, happy people hanging out together. Kind of intolerable to read about. Um, so that's, that's all I can think of um, is, and also like, but when I really get a, do love a character, I will suddenly give them more screen time. Like Magnus was initially supposed to just like appear, throw a party and leave. And I was like, oh, I really love him. You know, I want to keep him around and kind of make him a bigger character. I do write, like writing shifting, the shifting point of views, um, and they're going to continue through um, the next of the two. They're going to continue. Th uh, okay, so the question is, do, you know, is shifting point of view, um, she wanted to know if there would be more of Alex's point of view. Um, and I, love, I like writing shifting point of view because I feel like then you're jumping from the most interesting, you know, the, the people who the most interesting thing is happening to to the people who the most interesting is happening to rather than following one character around while they get coffee and pizza and meanwhile the characters that you are not following battle demons to death. <laughs> so you can kind of stick with the people who are having the exciting moment. Um, and there will be more, there is more Alec um, point of view in the, in the second book. Um, because he, because of what happens, I mean, I'm trying not to spoil, because of what happens with him at the end of City of Fallen Angels, he sort of gets made an offer, and it doesn't get followed up on, so he has to follow up on it in the second book, so we follow him as he does that. <laughs> uh, and so would I, would I write from more, uh, more than one point of view? So one of the things that I decided, because um, when I wrote my, my first teen series, the Modern Writers <coughs> series, it was um, third person, and it, it did skip around some point of view wise, and so one of the things that I wanted to do when I started Curse Workers is I really wanted it to be different. I wanted to try and see if I could try to have a kind of more noir style for this, and um, so I decided I would do third, you know, I would do first person really, and and then uh, because the first book is kind of a memory mystery, I wound up in present tense. I wound up actually rewriting half of the first book when I realized it had to be <laughs> present tense. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, I thought, this will be great, I'll be really pushing myself, and then I realized hard things are hard. <laughs> <laughs> but now that, I, now that I have settled on it, I think I have to keep going in in, in that kind of really tight first-person, present-sense yeah. point of view. I did write um, 13 vignettes from Layla's point of view, though, and it was really fun. They're, they're online, and it was really fun to actually kind of get out of his yeah. point of view and actually see what's really going on well, from other people's. Yeah, the, <laughs> yes, please look, there's a way to get to them from my website. It should oh, be awesome. easy, but, um, but, so I think I'm going to stay with that, but I do, I will say that the next thing I write will be third person. <laughs> 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 and probably will skip the points. <laughs> Never <laughs> <laughs> Um, How do you feel about when people get, like, runes or quotes or stuff tattooed. Like, I have a um, fearless rune, and I've seen a couple Ooh. other um, marks, and, like, I've seen quotes and stuff. How do you feel about that? Are you, like, flattered or kind of freaked out? <laughs> <laughs> I was at the midnight release party um, for... Uh, okay, sorry, the question is, how do I feel about people getting quotes and tattoos tattooed on their bodies? Um, uh, I was at the midnight release party uh, for Holly and my books in San Diego, and a woman came up wearing a shirt that said Jace, and I didn't really look at it much at first, because I've, you know, I've seen shirts that say that before, and then I realized that she had an arrow pointing down to her stomach, and she was pregnant, and she was like, I'm naming my baby Jace. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> Is your husband okay with that? And like, he appeared out of nowhere and was like, yes, badass name. <laughs> Rides a flying motorcycle and kills demons can be awesome. I was like, See, to me, that's a commitment. <laughs> that would freak me out. I was like, okay, as long as you guys are both down with it. I mean, at least it's a real name. <laughs> um, but uh, when I'm really, I'm usually really like thrilled when I see people with quotes and tattoos. I think it's really awesome. Um, and I try to take pictures and send them to the to Valerie, the artist who was actually the person who inspired the books, who who has the, who designed the tattoos, because she has like a little gallery of collections of them. So, 
I, if I were to ever get a tattoo, I don't have any, which is kind of ironic, but I think you're always obsessed with the things that you sort of don't have yourself, um, then I would, I would want a literary themed one, so I totally sympathize. I agree, <laughs> and I would also say that was only the first of two Jay's babies we saw. <laughs> <laughs> In the blue, yeah. So you have uh, an interesting habit of causing characters from one of your books to end up in the other of your books. Uh, does this mean in any way that your books take place in a similar world, or just talk a little more about that? It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when we were when we were both growing up, we read. Um, a bunch of urban fantasy writers, uh, a lot of them who contributed to the border, to the original Border Town series, you know, Atari Windling, um, Emma Bull, Alan Kushner, Jane Yolen. Um, you will see them seed their books with little moments, characters, bands from each other's series. And if you read a bunch of them, you started to put it together and it felt like the world became weirdly real. <laughs> because if something from one place could show up in another place, then maybe it was real. And um, and also you felt like you were part of a community, like the fact that you noticed it, and it was such a great feeling that, that we wanted to do, you know, that we also like enjoy doing it, and it's kind of fun. Um, so, uh, but, <laughs> so it, there's a possibility. It is possible that the modern fairy tale really, world and the Shadow Hunters world overlap. Uh, that would mean that people in the modern fairy tale world are deceived as to the nature of the world, <laughs> which is uh, problematic for them. I mean, I, because because some of them must know. Like, Robin must know, and he's just like, uh, I'm not going to bother telling you. He's like, well, like, we don't really need to know that there's vampires, do you? Um, and, uh, and, and accords, so why would you need to know about that? Um, but uh, but when I have, I have um, in the Curse Workers world, which is clearly an alternate world because it's an open fantasy where everyone knows there's magic. It's a world where uh, a certain percentage of people know there's magic. I mean, sorry, a certain percentage of people have magic. Everyone knows about it, and magic is illegal. So our world can't overlap there, but I do but have that a... Stoner Jason, that I do have an alternate <laughs> world Jason. <laughs> <laughs> a Jason that grew up in a different world. <laughs> and is a totally different person as a result. But is possibly dating his sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't really reread for that reason. I mean, Neil Gaiman once said, like, once you get your finished book, the first thing that will happen is you'll open it, and the second thing that will happen is that you'll find a typo. <laughs> so I, was, I believe that that is true. You will see all the things that are imperfect, and they cannot be changed. So there's no point, really, torturing yourself. The only time, the times that I look back at my books are to check facts and dates and times and stuff so that the stuff in the later book matches up, although I have also separate research timelines and all that for that stuff. But I don't read them for fun, and I don't read them to see what's wrong with them. I try to, like, you know, learn and move on going forward. Any time that let me change anything, I'm sure I have something to change. Um, I'm always like, I, I, yeah, that's exactly, that's what reprints are. <laughs> you can always find something, especially, like, reading. You go on tour, and you read a section, and, the, and while you're on tour, you'll slowly come to realize all the parts you want to change about it, and then you'll come home and then email your editor, and then your editor's like, stop, stop, leave it alone. So I think there's always, if you can fiddle, you will fiddle. And he says, you don't really, you know, like me that way. You like Magnus. And Alec's like, oh, this is so humiliating. And Jason's like, right, you know, like, kiss me right now, right? 
And Alec is like, actually, that would be disgusting because you're kind of like my brother, so I really don't want to. Wow, how about that? <laughs> Waste all that time. 